Warning, the following video may contain images and content that some viewers may find upsetting. Viewers discretion advised. Hi guys and welcome to Project Diaries. Uh, you can probably tell by my tone and my face that today's not going to be a regular video. Uh, I've actually been in hospital again and today I was supposed to have an operation that I've been fighting to get for over 20 years um, and I'm absolutely at my wits end. I don't really know uh, what to do. As you can see there's nothing growing either and the weather's terrible so I'm, I'm I don't know. Um, I know a lot of you have been asking lots of questions about my health because I've covered this a few times or mentioned this in a few videos over the past year and it is on the decline so I thought I'd uh, answer all of those questions in one big video get rid of it and hopefully move on and become positive after this um, so today I just want to go back and show you the history of my health and it all started when I was born uh, I was born with spinal bifida this is a birth defect where there's an incomplete closure of the backbone there are three different types that can affect the neck the middle part of the spine but in my case it was the lower part this is known as mild malinga cell or open spinal bifida which is the most severe form as this condition doesn't run in my family this was purely down to environment and due to the fact that my mum didn't have enough folic acid or vitamin B in her diet before and during pregnancy. Thankfully this is common knowledge now and pregnant women are encouraged to take supplements to lower the risk of any birth defects such as spinal bifida and hydrocephalus. Having an open spine at birth it meant I needed surgery right away and by the time I was three the curvature of my spine caused by scoliosis was so severe they needed to do something about it immediately. So at that point my mum decided that she didn't want any metal uh, or bolts in my body, especially my spine. So she allowed them to take a, a, a graft or a cutting from my hip bone uh, and they fused my spine to stop it from curving over anymore. I had major spine surgery at the age of three, five and seven, which were completely life-changing and also life-threatening. I nearly died a few times on the operating theater. Also, when I was born, the umbilical cord was wrapped around my leg uh, and that kind of um, stopped the blood flow. So I now have a paralyzed leg from the knee down and a club foot, which looks a bit like this. Now, I had several operations on my leg and foot as well to uh, release the tendons because my foot was curved in so much. And they did the best that they could, but I still had trouble walking. Um, and this obviously changed my life. Uh, I spent a lot of time in and out of hospital from the Royal Alexandra guys uh, Great Ormond Street and Stanmore. I cannot thank the staff there enough for what they did for me and my family. It, it was just incredible. But this meant I lost a lot of education and I spent most of my education years in hospital and uh, in a hospital bed because I was bed bound for, for months on end. Uh, there was even times where I spent six months in hospital in Stanmore uh, just to let my, my spine heal. For this healing it meant that my whole body had to be in a plaster cast from from here all the way down past my knees because my spine had to stay straight at all times uh, so I couldn't use a wheelchair uh, and at that young age um, I was basically pulled around in this really quirky and basic uh, sort of uh, handmade uh, cart that kids used to pull me around in and kids soon realized that if they tapped on my uh, my body cast that it made a funny noise and there was a few times that I was just bombarded with groups of quite vicious kids uh, even at the age of, sort of five and seven so my parents had to send me back to the hospital a few times because they they'd actually hit me so hard uh, they they cracked a body cast so I had to be recast a few times and obviously it was it was quite um, soul destroying at the fact that I couldn't uh, bend my body to sit on a toilet and just needed help with with everything that I could do so once that was all said and done, um, I was out of the body cast and by the age of eight, uh, I was told that I'd be in a wheelchair by the time I was 12. But obviously these body casts were on for so long, it just weakened all of my body, including my core strength. And I, I couldn't stand. Uh, over those three times, I had to teach myself how to walk. And I was just determined. Um, I was a really fun loving kid and I had lots of love and support by my entire family. Uh, but unfortunately, the um, Rehabilitation wasn't available under the NHS, so my, my parents are under extreme pressure to pay for the £20,000 plus um, physio and, um, and recovery costs. So in that time, I was actually in a wheelchair and there was no children's wheelchairs available. So I had to have an adult's chair like this one. And that just basically opened my eyes up to how vicious people can be and how un 
unthoughtful the what the world is. I could go in certain department stores and their their aisles would be so narrow I couldn't get this big chair in and and people would just stare at me and look at me and it was just it was just a nasty experience to have at such a young age but it it built my tolerance up for just how how nasty people can be which is why I ended up doing my my bully video which um was really gratefully received so hopefully you guys have seen that one now while I was at a, a normal infant school uh, as a child I was later refused entry to a junior school uh, because the headmaster point blank just said he didn't want a special kid in his class in his school uh, and my my mum lost it <laughs> good luck to her well good luck to him uh, she was a force to be reckoned with at that point but she managed to get me into a, a more special school uh, which was uh, for disabled kids but at that point it just felt like my my education was uh, put on pause again uh, lots of these kids had incredibly severe disabilities and a, a lot of my friends at that time are no longer alive because life expectancies with those kind of illnesses is is, is very low um so it was it was quite a it's quite an ordeal to uh, to go through that the one good thing about being in a disabled school is that there was a pool access within the school and we had regular swimming we had so many sports they got me into archery wheelchair basketball it was just all about physio and it was less about education so that part of my education of, of uh, reading writing uh, and a maths and things really sort of suffered but my physical abilities were incredible i then became what my parents called me as a water baby you couldn't get me out of that that pool for love nor money and even though it seemed like fun to me i didn't realize that how much that was that was building my strength and confidence and it just did so much for me it actually built my strength up my upper body strength um to a point where i actually uh i i was winning all of my swimming uh lessons and and then i got loads of swimming badges and because i could swim so far with my upper body strength i then uh, got put forward to doing loads of swimming competitions and this is the very first medal I won coming first place back in 1986, all thanks to my lucky shorts. Uh, and that, that took me on to applying for the Special Olympics, which was one of the most incredible experiences of my life at that time. To be in like an Olympic state, uh, Olympic pool was just absolutely overwhelming. Uh, but I got through to the finals, um, but unfortunately I got stitched on my last, uh, on my last pool lap on freestyle. And I got disqualified because I couldn't finish my lap. But that didn't end it all there. It was just such an amazing experience. I, I loved all of that. And just to be a part of the Special Olympics was incredible. But thankfully, by the time I was 11, 11, sorry, um, I was allowed back into high school, uh, which changed all of my perspective on life. I felt normal again, normal. <laughs> Uh, and I was allowed to join all of my friends and it was just it started off and it was an amazing experience uh, and then again the bullying started and then uh, my health started declining again because I just didn't have enough access to swimming pools so I ended up in hospital again and they fitted me with a back brace which is like this one but again being in high school and being bullied uh, kids don't realize that that was actually protecting my spine and a lot of kids in uh, break times decided to use me like a punch bag and one guy even kicked me in the back uh, and hit me to the floor. Uh, but having a spine like mine means all my central nervous system uh, is is a lot closer to the uh, to the outside of my spine, so it's really sensitive. And one hit in the wrong place, I could end up paralysed from the neck down and in a wheelchair. But school kids didn't care. High school kids are just pretty nasty as well. There were some amazing people. Uh, a lot of my older friends had my back while I was in the earlier years, and thank you guys for doing that. Uh, but as soon as they left it, it felt like I was in a in a bit of a bit of a pickle when I couldn't defend myself. So when I was 19, the doctors decided to have another go at my foot and uh, try and operate. And they they promised me it was going to be all singing, all dancing. To me, it felt like plastic surgery, and they were going to give me a real foot back because uh, at the moment it was it was more of a club foot, and my uh, my my toes were bending back, and the. Uh, I don't know what this. I can't remember what this part is called, but it was pulling my it was pulling my toes back, so it was more claw like. But the doctors promised me it was going to look more like my right foot, which I was like, yeah, give it to me. I'd love some of that, please. Uh, but while I was in hospital, that whole thing went completely wrong. Um, it was only when I took the cast off I realised that they had they'd actually cut off and removed all of my toes, 
and stuck them back on using uh, metal bars. And that's all it did. They, they didn't reform, reshape my foot at all. It, it, in fact, the whole operation went completely wrong and, and, and restricted my balance. Um, and it didn't seem like anything I could do. I didn't realize that you could put complaints in with the NHS. I always thought NHS was a free service you couldn't do anything about. So I just let it go. We had to swallow it. I, I struggled. My foot tips over. So at that point, I then started working with an orthopedic um, department. And they basically point blank refused me another operation that I've been wanting since I was 15. And that's to lengthen my legs. Uh, I have a, a shorter left leg, obviously, because uh, the the paralyzing blood flow uh, and I believed that if I was going to have to have this operation that it would level out my pelvis which would level out my back and then it, it would stop a lot more of my problems but they point blank refused said it wasn't available under the NHS so working with the orthopedics department had its own problems as well they had certain regulations to what they could build up with inside because I didn't want anybody to know that I had these built up shoes because there was so much pressure as a kid to wear certain clothes and wear, wear designer shoes and the ones that were available at that time were absolutely horrific. They weren't fashionable at all. So I wanted to build up on the inside, but because my leg was shorter, you can, I'm just gonna show you now, look. That's, that's how much leg difference there is. Uh, they wouldn't let me have this build up within my shoe. Uh, and then it took me two years to work with that uh, specific department to where they finally agreed after going through all of their loopholes and all of their suggestions, they finally agreed to build this shoe for me. And they, that used to be built within that department. So I only had a week to wait, but within that week, the NHS cut the funding and shut that department down. So basically I had to start again uh, a year later with a different department. Now, thankfully it's, it's now been going through a lot more smoother, but unfortunately those uh, changes and those builds are not, not done within the NHS anymore. They're done by a privatized company and they take forever. You have to get your measurements done within the department themselves. They have to then send it off to the private company. If there's any changes, those shoes come back. It takes two or three months for each thing to be done. So two years later, I've now got these shoes. Look at the size of that. Now, the style is lovely. I really love what they do. And I think it's fantastic, uh, the, the amount of uh, different styles that they offer people now. I'm just gonna put this back on, hang on. <laughs> That's better. <laughs> um, but, I mean, it, it's solved one problem, but it's created 10 others. The, the weight of the shoes is now causing my knees and thighs to have problems. And obviously being paralyzed on, on the left leg, it's a lot weaker, so it's now causing me to have back pain that's now domino affecting all the way up through my shoulder and neck. And I've now been in a worse shape than, than I've ever been. Um, when I was 21, uh, the spine surgeons dropped me by basically saying that my spine was fine. Even though the curvature and everything was, was bad, it wasn't getting any worse. So they just basically dropped me at that age. So nearly 20 years later, I'm still fighting to see a spine specialist. I've had to go through a, a regular doctor, uh, my GP that went through another specialist that then said it was too severe. She said, what do I want? And I wanted to go through spine specialist, pain therapy, physio. I want to see a back brace and I want to see a surgeon. Uh, and it's now taken me two years to go through that full circle. And there's just so many problems. All I wanted was an x-ray as well and an MRI scan with a CT scan. You'd think they'd get that out of the way first, but <laughs> a year later, I ended up seeing a neurologist. Nobody asked me to see a neurologist. I didn't want to see a neurologist. And when I walked into the office, he was like, what are you doing here? And I was like, you're not a spine specialist. <laughs> we kind of just exchanged jokes, but it was it is a joke. The way that the, the, the whole service is at the moment and um, with the cuts from, from the Tory government, the NHS is a mess and it's on its knees. And it's, it's I say this with a smile on my face because I've been through the mill right now. I've been through four years of hell. But I'm finally getting through to the end of it with the shoes and some other pain relief. And basically I'm on a whole bag of medication that I'm trying out, including morphine. Uh, that's an opiate that is just so strong. Um, 
that's why I haven't been around for a while because I've been on, I have to put a patch on for a week and they basically just vegetate me. I, I can't barely string sentences together or, or leave my house and get out of bed. It's just getting so bad, which is obviously affecting my care for Grandad and his health is now deteriorating because I just can't do everything that I was doing for him before, which is now putting more pressure and stress onto me. That is, you know, I there's only so much I can do, but I feel so guilty not being able to look after him. So after being dropped by the doctors and running myself ragged through the NHS and trying to get things out of the way, I decided to go on a family holiday. Uh, and unfortunately, within three days, I ended up in hospital. I thought I was having a heart attack, but uh, when they rushed me in in the early hours in A&E, they said I'd ruptured my stomach. Uh, so I had to rest for three days and I was just basically convulsing and I couldn't keep anything down. So that was pretty bad, ruined the family holiday and when we came back I decided to do a bit more travelling after I, I uh, fixed myself. So I went to Thailand and within 11 hours I ended up in hospital. Oh god, I have to laugh because I'll cry. Um, yeah, I had a great time uh, in before those 11 hours but uh, I ended up going to uh, a local bar and I went to the toilet and while I was in the uh, the bathroom cubicle, uh, some real funny, hilarious joker decided to come in and put toilet rolls in each of the toilets and flush them all. So this obviously caused them to overflow. This completely flooded the toilet and what were my balance issues? I had trouble getting out of the cubicle, uh, but I finally got through, washed my hands and as I turned around, another bunch of kids decided to rush through the door while I was holding a glass bottle. The glass hit my hit my hand and as the bottle split it went through uh, this part of my hand and then I slipped over and cut off the top of my finger. I don't know if you can see that. So I was rushed to a, uh, a Bangkok hospital uh, on the back of a pickup truck and unfortunately they didn't take me to the um, the foreigners, the tourist hospital and they took me to a local hospital so I couldn't understand anything anyone was saying they couldn't understand what I was saying and they started operating on my finger without any anesthesia at all they just started pinning me I must have had about ten nine or ten different nurses around me pinning me down I was screaming I tell you, it felt like I was in some kind of horror movie because there was other people being operated on in the same room and I was just like there's no sterilizing I didn't even know now, now this isn't any bad thing about Asian hospitals, some people have really, really done a good job over there, but I'm just sharing my experience. And because of this, uh, this um, language gap, I thought they said come back in five days. So I went back to my hotel, I couldn't do anything. It was, I had both, both arms in plaster because I'd cut through, I don't know if you can see that, I cut through that, that tendon as well. So these, these fingers were just a bit flappy. Um, so I spent five days in my, my hotel uh, and then I had to embarrassingly ask for uh, the, the maids to do up my trousers and undo my trousers and it was it was quite an ordeal but you know I was in Thailand and a lot of people especially the cab drivers when I had to go back to the hospital kept trying to get me to go for massages and I was like dude I just need to go to hospital can you not tell that I'm a little bit sort of <laughs> in need at the moment so after five days I went back to the hospital and there was a lot of stir and a lot of kind of shouting and confusion and um, when I got back they took off the cast and the whole thing had been infected. What they meant to say was come back every day for five days and get it cleaned but being in Thailand it wasn't the, uh, the best of uh, clean conditions so my finger got infected. And then they said something like, uh, this will take another three weeks to fix. At that point, I was losing my mind. This is the first, at that point, I'd been in Bangkok for 11 hours and my trip was getting worse and worse by the minute. So, uh, gratefully, I spoke to an auntie who lives in Australia. So I flew to Australia to see her in Melbourne and then I got looked after there, which was fantastic. Um, so after about two or three weeks, uh, I managed to sort my sort the stitches out. I took those out. Everything was was fine. So I carried on my trip and decided to go to Sydney. At which point, within the first day, my hand swelled up like Mickey Mouse. Uh, I couldn't even I couldn't move my fingers. They were like huge sausages. So I ended up going back into hospital in Sydney. 
at which they then did an x-ray and realized that the Bangkok hospital sewed some glass that was still in my finger and it got severely infected. Um, so at that point I was just like, please just cut my finger off, I've had enough. It's just getting too much, but the, the Australian uh, staff at the hospital were phenomenal. They were so great. Um, and at that point I just I just wanted to go home. But they, they looked after me, patched me up. Uh, again, I was back in a cast and I, I ended up staying in a hostel and things just got really bad. But thankfully because of my insurance company, they put me in a nice hotel and I had a, a fairly good time at the end of that trip. So when I came back all refreshed, everything seemed to be going really well. My health started getting back to normal and I decided that life is good. So I ended up uh, entering a competition for me to be one of the first commercial astronauts uh, in space. <laughs> I know, was, yeah, I didn't believe it myself. But anyway, with the love and support that I had from the, the popularity that I had from being a music promoter and a band manager, I managed to get myself in those, uh, in those finals and I went to London and I basically, I worked. I was a machine. I became so fit. My core strength was great. I was at the peak of my ability. Um, and it was just, it was amazing. But as soon as I got to the competition, I was pulled aside and one of the guys uh, offered to pay me £250 if I'd quit, uh, which I couldn't understand. So I asked him lots of questions and said, well, why, why don't you want me to get involved? And it turned out it was down to their insurance. They didn't want to have a disabled person uh, going up in their spaceship and uh, they basically just offered to pay me not to go. So 250 quid or my chance to go in space? Obviously I said I want to go to space, you can uh, you can do one with your money. <laughs> but um, it was basically a long term thing, there was about 200 people uh, split over two days so there's 100 people to go through in one day and my name went from nearer the top down to the bottom so by the end of the day i was completely exhausted you never knew when your name was going to get called you had to be there on the spot and then you had to do the assault course get through and they halfway through they uh one of the uh people stewards flagged me and said that i cheated and obviously i'd been there all day uh i had full well of knowing what was going on um, and they were basically just trying to disqualify me so I kicked off and uh, they allowed me to have another go and they were going to let me rest the the actual people that were were heading or hosting the, the competition were going to let me rest and then have another go later on but there was a sort of stewards inquiry and some whispering and some stuff going on with the event organizers and uh, all of a sudden I had to go on then and there he's coming around it again he's knackered but He's gonna do it. I'm gonna give the countdown in three, two, one, go. So I'd already just exerted myself, but they made me go straight on anyway. And despite the fact I went exactly the same way that I did before, the judge didn't say anything, but because I was so exhausted, I ended up just under a second below qualifying time. As he bounces down the last section, he smashes a time of 42.20 and he's goosed. The moral of this story is I was at my physical peak at the point where I was coming home from work one night and five guys decided to jump me. Um, I was attacked brutally at early hours of the morning when I was coming in from work. Uh, and I, I, I've, been through, I've been through certain violent things before. I've, been, I've had violent attacks through, you know, since I was three, or three five, seven. All the way through high school, everything. I've, I've been attacked before. I, I used to be able to handle that. But for five people, i got long hair, you probably can't tell, but they used my hair to pin me against the floor. Um, and one guy actually used my head like a football. He, he stepped back and took a running kick, uh, which obviously knocked me out for a few bits. Um, and when I came to, they decided to leave me alone and I staggered down to see the police officers that were... Lurking around the bottom, obviously, it was at its centre of town, so there was police around at that time. So I explained to the police which direction they were going in, and uh, I, they headed. They took me to the police station to where I had to make my statement. I late, later heard that they found the, uh, the attackers and that they were um, being arrested. But unfortunately, I lost consciousness in the, in the police station, and the, uh, the sergeant then took me to hospital where I had concussion uh, and uh, fractured my... Um, collarbone and some other injuries I was also losing clumps of hair where they just ripped my hair out so I made good of that 
how, how, how I hear you say. As I was so well known for being a music promoter, I decided to use my popularity and cut off the rest of my hair to highlight a really amazing charity called the Little Princess Trust. This charity makes wigs for children with cancer and alopecia. As I lost clumps of hair during the attack, it opened a window for me to see what these kids go through on a daily basis. My initial goal was to try and make at least one child happy due to the fact that these wigs cost between 1200 and two grand. With lots of press releases, donations came in really well. But I wanted to go one step further, so I set a target of five grand, and if I hit that target, I'd do something really extravagant. I hit my target in just a few months, so I put it under public vote, and they all decided I needed a lizard Mohican. The only reason I was able to do so much focus on this charity work was because uh, from that I then had agoraphobia for, for six months. Uh, now unfortunately my doctors did nothing other than put me on beta blockers for my uh, anxiety. There was nothing they could really do. Um, so I basically just sat by myself in my room. I even had the fear when I, uh, I tried to use the bathroom. I couldn't. I can't explain anybody that hasn't had agoraphobia. It's this your feet just ground to the floor you want to be tunnel vision you it's overwhelming and overpowering it, it you don't have control of your own body so after finally getting over my anxiety and my agoraphobia it then went to court where i won uh, only one of my attackers uh, got arrested and and got sent through the legal system and i was awarded a small amount of compensation uh, obviously i lost nearly a year's wage and and lost my company at that point uh, but the small amount was insignificant i just wanted justice but five years on i've heard nothing uh, i'm now putting a legal team together to to go up against the magistrate courts and a legal system because i wasn't offered any kind of uh, support or or help before or after the, the case and the way that they treated me in the courts was absolutely disgusting. I found the judge was very condescending, and I was I was just talked down to, and it was it was an awful experience to have even even just recovering from agoraphobia. I, I went through counselling, I went through therapy, all of which were in a negative light because they they were messing with this whole Pandora's box of PTSD and and depression and things that they didn't really know or have control of now i understand that antidepressants and counseling and therapy works for some people i'm not i'm not slating that i'm not i'm not saying that isn't a thing that some people should do i'm purely saying that that was in a 45 minute session or an hour session we branched off so much there was no control on their behalf and they basically left me open for a week until i had my next session and that was absolutely, that was, I, I turned self-destructive. There was nothing I could do about it. So I had to blanket that, I had to stop that. I had 18 months of hell going through that. I I put through, I put my family through so much. Uh, and I found out more about my personal life and more about my, my health history going through the system and asking for, for these medical records because we just took everything as face value back in the day. We didn't we didn't mind about that and it it was eye-opening but i was also really annoyed because i didn't know about the fact that my bone had been taken away from my hip i always thought that was a, a deformity that i had as a child and the amount of scars that i've had i've got 16 different scars over different various parts of my body now so after i got away from uh agoraphobia and i got my house back oh the sun's up um i basically decided to go on a holiday to which some of my friends actually sponsored me to go uh, to America. A lot of my friends and a lot of the bands that I work with live over there and they decided to treat me and it was absolutely epic. I had such a good time and thank you guys for, for allowing me to go through that at such an awful time. Uh, but again after a few weeks my stomach started um, expanding to a point where it was so uncomfortable. Uh, I was rushed into hospital uh, early hours again and A&E just misdiagnosed me saying it was constipation and, and gave me some laxatives and said get on your way. So I did what they said and nothing happened and another day later 24 hours I got rushed into hospital again where they still said it was constipation they gave me an enema which is great and uh, again just sent me on my way. 
Uh, and then within a few hours, I'd actually got rushed into another hospital where my heart, again, I felt like my heart was breaking. I thought I was, I was in so much pain. I was screaming out in agony. I just, I couldn't do anything. Uh, and then before the, the hospital could actually give me any kind of, or ask me for any kind of medical history, they were getting me to sign consent forms for an emergency operation because they suspected that I had a ruptured appendicitis and that my body was becoming toxic and I had to have an, uh, an operation there and then. Uh, but I couldn't understand that my heart was hurting. Why my appendix? Uh, but, you know, doctors being doctors, I went along with it. So I had this operation. And when I woke up, I was numb uh, from from here uh, from here down. Um, and obviously, they just said it was under the due to the anaesthetic, and it it would come back normally. And because of the uh, the laxatives, the first hospital gave me that that ended start started to kick in. <laughs> and if I had no feeling and. Uh, like a quart of, of laxatives, it was not a pretty sight, can I tell you that? It was a pretty graphic ordeal for 18 days. And then the hospital then realized that um, my insurance we were gonna pay for everything. And because they were then worried that they've actually caused some kind of problems, I then became a cash cow. Every five minutes I was having an x-ray or an MRI or a CT scan or this, they were going through this test or they were having this blood test and to a point where I was getting more and more ill. A few days after my operation, I started to get the shivers and the sweats uh, and I was suspected that I had sepsis. So I was rushed to ICU where I remained for five days uh, to try and level out my, uh, my system. Once I was then returned to a regular ward, I was able to go onto the internet and ask a lot of friends and people that were in the health system back in the UK what might have happened to me. And it was speculated at the fact that due to the doctors not taking any information or medical history on my disability, they may have laid me on an operating theater without any padding. And as you know, the, my spine, um, the nerves on, are, are closer to the outside. And it's speculated that they may have crushed or um, limited uh, a certain nerve in my back which has caused the numbness. In their defense the hospital was just saying it was a pre-existing condition based on my disability and that there was nothing that they did wrong. And I was begging and pleading to the uh, insurance company to discharge me from this hospital because I don't think I think it was more detrimental to my health and they were trying to cover their own back rather than taking my own care into consideration. At that point, uh, because it was a student hospital, now I'm not gonna name names for legal reasons, but I was then having groups of students coming in and, and asking me questions, uh, and I just didn't want any of it. I mean, I'm ill, I, I appreciate you need to learn, but just it, not at this particular time, thank you very much. And then one, one student came in and just didn't even read my notes, started examining me and pushed on my stomach. Now obviously I've got internal stitches on my appendix at that point. So she ruptured those uh, stitches. I had blood coming out of parts of my body that I shouldn't have. It was the most traumatic situation. I was screaming in pain. I have never been in that much pain before in my life. Yet the doctors and the whole hospital treated me like I was some kind of addict. Like I was trying to blag painkillers. And it was I couldn't believe it. I, I didn't understand what was going on. I'd been through all of this operation. I was numb. I couldn't feel anything. I could barely stand and yet they, they wouldn't give me any pain meds. I couldn't understand what was happening. But the insurance company finally agreed to discharge me and fly me first class back to England uh, to where I then saw a urologist and some other doctors who basically just tested to see if my kidneys were all right, tested if my liver was all right. And then basically said, oh, it, you know, it'll be all right. It'll come back within sort of two or three weeks. Three months went by. I had another another examination. They went, oh, you know, it'll come back. Don't worry about it. Just keep going. 18 months later, I was still numb. So I decided to start a lawsuit against the hospital in question. Now, thankfully, working with some amazing bands, I was in touch with some very influential people in, in America, and I was offered some incredible lawyers. 
uh, even uh, one guy who uh, was an injury lawyer for the NFL. So I had the legal backing that I needed. But unfortunately, due to all of my uh, disability and my, my health issues previously, there wasn't a single doctor that we could get hold of that was willing to put his neck on the line to say that it was negligence or a, a fault within the hospital. So after two years, even though I was offered a pro bono case, uh, that, that then had to be forgotten about. So that was quite a traumatic deal for me, and I still can't really let that one go. But thankfully, after the 18 months, I did start getting feeling back, and it, it, it returned me back to the, the, the physical state that I was at before. But unfortunately, I mean, I was in that hospital for around three weeks. Uh, I bounced around a couple of hospitals, but I was in a hospital bed for three weeks. So again, that destroyed all of my core strength, my back muscles, my leg muscles. I was weak again. I felt like I got all the way back to the beginning and the NHS wasn't helping me. America dropped me. I've seen both sides of that coin. I know America wants to talk about the way that their health system is and how great England is. I can tell you now, they're both good and they're both bad. I'm not gonna get into that debate. I'm just saying I've been on both sides of that coin. So, you know, each side has its benefits and, and, and bad parts. So my health started improving i was i was getting back to normal i started doing lots of fitness and i was getting back to to how i felt good so i decided to take granddad on a holiday because the, the poor man has been through so much with these heart attacks and a stroke and you know together we decided that we needed to get away uh, so i decided to take him on our first cruise and at that point i still needed uh wheelchair assistance and so did he um, but i decided to use his wheelchair as a zimmer frame if we ever needed to get out but i specifically paid a lot of money for this company that that promised us lots of help uh, and assistance and um, when we got to gatwick gatwick are incredible their wheelchair assistants were phenomenal they helped us all the way through we had no problems we was that we were laughing and singing and having jokes with all the staff we got on the plane we were so excited and the second we got into uh, italy it all just fell apart. It was a four hour delay at which we had no help with the cases. Now I had two cases and an old man in a wheelchair plus my own problems. And we just got left by the wayside. Uh, there was nothing we could do. Uh, so we waited four hours and then when the coach turned up, they then just basically was like, well, you know, get on the coach. We were like, well, is there nobody that's gonna help me with the cases? So we managed to get on the case, uh, on the coach, we then travelled uh, a few hours to our uh, the, to the port where we had to get the, the cruise ship. And as we were getting off, there was chaos. I mean, you can imagine how many thousands of people were getting on a cruise ship at the same time and how many coaches are turning up. It was bedlam. So I've already trying to juggle Grandad and getting him off the coach and trying to get his wheelchair sorted and then trying to get our own cases and backwards and forwards. I was in agony at that point. And I was starting to regret why, why I'd even done this. I thought it was going to be a lot more easier to do and there was going to be some people to help us on the way like the company uh, promised us in all this hustle and bustle i decided i basically got the cases and as i turned around granddad's wheelchair ran over my foot and broke two of my toes <laughs> yeah i got loads of luck but um yeah i mean that hindered the entire trip i could barely do anything all the all the time we were going to go everywhere it was fantastic i wanted to take him to pisa and rome and uh, Greece and uh, Cro uh, Croatia uh, and it, it would have been amazing but we couldn't even get off the ship I was in so much pain and so you know if there was nobody on the ship that was helping us out and if it wasn't for a beautiful English couple that, that helped us and every time they saw us it, you know that that whole trip would have been mad it would have been a mess uh, so obviously granddad had a fantastic time he didn't care less he was out away from the tv and out of his house he was living a dream it was the first big holiday he's had in years uh, but when i come back i kind of hit another depression and it really affected my health and that started to decline quite a bit but the good news is i then with the help of abta i i then sued the uh the cruise company and managed to get my money back so that wasn't that wasn't too hard and that went through quite quickly and it, it was weird how it's funny how quick a, a, a travel agency will, will listen once you get ABTA in. So there's a good bit of advice if you have any uh, troubles on holiday. But the good news out of this, at the same time, the orthopaedic surgeon that I was then talking to had then asked to fuse my ankle, at which I then point blank 
refused he then got me to go through all the shoes and the orthopedics i went through all of the hoops and he finally got to the point where he said he was going to give me the leg lengthening operation that i'd so wanted uh back when i was 15 and this is 25 years of begging and pleading and going through everything that system is and he's finally going to give me this operation but after all of the attack cases and the stuff with American hospitals and my own health declining and just the the, the case with the cruise company and losing all my dis disabled rights and the government just basically turning me into a number and putting me through the system, that entire stress caused me to have a heart attack and I have never panicked or worried so much in my life. Um, I was then rushed to A&E with severe chest and heart pains where they then strapped me to an ECG machine which seemed to be going all over the place. Long story short, A&E then released me saying that I'd have an emergency uh, appointment with a cardiologist. Now they, they couldn't tell me whether it was going to be 24 hours, 48 hours a week. Uh, but this emergency appointment ended up taking three months. Uh, they also gave me a 48 hour take which is a heart monitor they strap on to, um, to to see how your heart is reacting over this period of time. Then after I finally got this uh, appointment the cardiologist just basically put it down to anxiety and said it wasn't a heart attack and that I should just come off my medication and everything would be fine. After taking his advice I then ended up in hospital again uh, I then chose to go back on beta blockers. Uh, because my heart just wasn't right. Uh, so I asked for more scans on my heart. They then t took another couple of months to get those tests through uh, and those tests have now shown that I have a weaker left valve uh, that is now prolapsing, pushing blood back into my heart, causing pain and palpitations. Uh, now they, due to the fact no one's ever looked at my heart before, they, they're not sure whether this is a pre-existing condition. This could be the cause of what happened on my family holiday in Tenerife. This could be what happened in America, which was then um, assumed as ruptured appendicitis. No one knows. Uh, and basically, the doctors have just said, stay on my medication and they'll, they'll keep an eye on it. But it just goes to show if I actually listened to the cardiologist and just put it down to anxiety that I wouldn't have had that test and I wouldn't have found out that I have a heart problem. I'm now on two of the same medications that Grandad's on for his heart. Uh, I was told that I had a heart of a, an 85 year old, which is, is quite scary. Uh, and I don't fancy being on medication for the rest of my life. But again, I'm just gonna have to see how that works out. Those people that support this channel, thank you so much for getting me through that time. It wasn't exactly easy. It's still not easy. Um, because I've got so many court cases coming up, I'm still waiting for my tribunal date uh, against the government. Um, the, the the court case for my attack is just basically in limbo. Um, my pain levels are just going through the roof. So, especially in my neck and, and my shoulders and my spine, everything is you know everything's just becoming a little bit too hard for me to deal with. It, it's just it's, it's it's soul destroying, and I, I really can't take any more. Especially with the fact that they are now just using me. England doctors feel like they're using me as a cash cow just to pump me full of all these pharmaceutical drugs and anything from anti-inflammatories and, and insomnia pills, sleeping pills, um, pain pain numbing, nerve ending uh, pills, laxatives. I'm on so many drugs. I just, I mean, if I shook, I'd sound like a maraca. It's just, I'm not a pill popper and I don't like that kind of way I'm more about healthy healthy living healthy eating so I will hopefully go on to another section in in project diaries where I can go on and do more health stuff so that brings me on to today uh, obviously I've gone for my pre-op and even though that my um, cardiologist has given me a note to say everything is fine um, the anesthetist is still not willing to to go with this leg lengthening operation um, so my back pain is going to get worse until they can they can find a time suitable to them, which usually takes another four months or so. So if I don't make it many videos uh, from now until then, it's because I simply just can't sit at my computer anymore. This whole video is absolutely killing me. Just the fact I'm standing up right now is I'm in agony. Um, uh, I just don't know I don't know where to go from here, guys. So. Uh, Well, hopefully this is this has answered a lot of uh, questions that people are asking me. Like I say, I want this to be a one and done. Hopefully, I got it all out of the way and, and I can move on. I don't, you know, my life just seems to be 
I'm, I'm not going to be defined by my disability or my health issues. This is not me. I want to get back to the happy me, the positive me, and doing tutorial videos that are helping thousands of people globally. So let's get back to that. I'm putting all this behind me. Uh, I will keep you up to date on what's going on with my heart and my doctors, and I'll do a couple of health videos. But anyway, hopefully that's all out the way, guys. You found this informative, and uh, I'll see you again next time. I'm not sure when it's going to be, but I still will work on videos as much as I can. Take care and look after yourself.